All right, so welcome everyone to episode six of the Average Ontario Anglers podcast. I never thought we'd get to four, but apparently we're at six right now, so that's <laughs> awesome. I'm your host, Jesse, and today, of course, we have the man with the mustache, Andrew. Hello. <laughs> I was going to say how you're doing, but you sound good. <laughs> anyway, this podcast is pretty interesting, and I feel like we've gotten a little more comfortable doing this, so I feel like it's going to be more loose and cool. Sounds super weird saying that, but loose and cool. If, if we say that, like, we're going to be loose and cool, then it's automatically not those things. <laughs> Only someone with a mustache would say it like that. <laughs> but anyway, this podcast is very interesting because two podcasts ago on episode four, we talked about steelhead fishing basics. This one is steelhead basics part two. Ooh. Part two, because I'll tell you what, you cannot cover everything in one part of one podcast. So this is episode number six, steelhead basics part two so i'm super stoked for that <laughs> and we would like to thank the sponsor of our podcast giveaway which is fish heads fish heads canada and uh fish heads canada the best part of the fish to, to eat no. <laughs> yeah fish heads canada if you're not aware they are an online shop that sells everything you need for steelhead fishing uh we've purchased stuff from them rods row the main thing that uh, i really like from fish heads is they have their pre-packaged already cured row yep and we're going to get more into that someone eventually. like me who doesn't feel like doing it and can't catch that first 10 and get my own yeah <laughs> but we're going to get more to get it. <laughs> into that but they sell everything hooks beads everything you need and uh jake the guy that runs it he's a legit guy the guy's a hammer if you check his instagram that guy knows how to fish but we'd like to thank him for sponsoring our giveaway and we're going to announce what that giveaway is after it's pretty good right andrew it's it's exciting it's very sure. good but anyway it's perfect for any listener of the show yes it, it, if you're just starting out or if you're legit some guy that already has all this stuff and you just need some more supplies this mm -hmm. is going to be an amazing giveaway yep but anyway we're going to start off this episode with interesting fishing fact of the week and to handle it this week we have the one the only andrew I've, you hype me up so much and then i can only do it you know i can only fail at that point <laughs> i feel like my dreams of being a circus announcer just never got recognized so i'm gonna do it now and i'm the monkey great <laughs> <laughs> and so, as always we're gonna give andrew he gives me letter grades yep and i'm gonna give him a number grade so yep. let's see how he does because last week i killed it you a did plus you did I, I don't know if i'm gonna kill it this week but i'm gonna try all right kill it all right so i, I wouldn't kill one of these okay <laughs> we splice that backwards and then all of a sudden jesse's a really bad guy in the fishing community <laughs> <laughs> so what what is one of the holy grails of fish spawning fish to catch in ontario here the holy grails of spawning fish to catch one of them i don't want to say it's the best but like it's how you i know you've caught a couple of them in your life i want to say bofin no, 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 no. I was, I was, uh, sorry, a running fish. Not just spawning. Running fish. Oh, running fish. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Atlantics? Yes, sir. Okay. Atlantic salmon. All Sweet. Right. So, Atlantic salmon was the only native salmon in Ontario. And all the other ones that we have now, all the pinks, the cohos, the chinook, they were all introduced. So, the only native one we had in Ontario was the Atlantic salmon, which for some isn't, you know, new information. But the last caught native salmon in Lake Ontario of the ones before they started restocking them was caught in guess what year? The last native Atlantic salmon ever. Uh, the 70s? 1898. Oh, I, I was... Hey, <laughs> look. I literally pre, didn't say 1970. No. <laughs> I, I meant 1870. <laughs> this is pre-World War I. Like, this is a long time ago. Wow. So Lake Ontario held the world's greatest freshwater population of Atlantic salmon. Hmm. Like, it, considering how few there are now, that's it's sad to see us at this point. But it was the world's biggest freshwater population. What happened was they used to be caught and sold by the barrel <laughs> in the 1800s. So hence why there's no more left. <laughs> so in uh, the restocking program that has had some success in recent years, started back in the 40s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 80s. They tried restocking them in, in the Lake Ontario, but unfortunately had failed on all those attempts. So 80s, there's a few minor successes, 
1990, and so this is more about the history of them restocking now. So in 1995, the M&R was stocking 200 fry for eight years. Only 200. 200? 200. Like literally none of those survived, I guarantee. <laughs> so uh, in 2006, they launched the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program, or also called Bring Back the Salmon. Okay. So now, in recent years, it has been uh, somewhat successful because we've actually found, and people have caught them, is uh, returning, spawning uh, Atlantic salmon coming into these creeks. Hmm. So now we have, again, when your first inter- interesting fishing fact was about the, the sturgeon or the lake trout, yep. we're talking about like the biggest. So I did the same thing here. Okay. Because I figured you'd like that. Okay. <laughs> So what was the largest Atlantic ever caught in Lake Ontario? I don't know. Cause like, I know like across the ocean, they have massive ones. Now this, now this is, so yes, this is so a Lake Ontario. So this fish. is Lake Ontario and this is recorded. So this is okay. post like introduction. Reference. Honestly, like here they don't get that big. But your eyebrows are telling me that it's big. I Like I want to, <laughs> I want to say like. 25 to 30 pounds hey okay so your first number there was much closer okay the largest was 24.3 pounds caught in 1889 still an impressive because like atlantics are very slim like the ones that i've caught anyway they're super muscular but they're very long and thin so it was it was just over 11 kilograms for anyone who's listening in like the uk or something but hey we actually do have one person that downloads our podcast in australia Oh, good day, mate. Yeah. <laughs> and we just lost them. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, the largest ever recorded, so this is a netted fish, the largest netted Atlantic salmon in the world. First, first guess what country it was caught in. Just to take it like, Scotland. It was. Yeah. Jesse's on a roll. Yeah. So you want to take a guess? This is in 1960. It was a netted fish. Okay. Take a guess at how many pounds it was. I know they get massive over there. Like, they're giant. I, I want to say, like, 70. 109 pounds. Oh. <laughs> that blew my mind. That's, like, I thought only big. kings got, broke the 100 mark. Yeah. 109 pounds. That's a giant fish. That's bigger than the record king salmon in Canada. Ooh. Like, that's bigger than BC king salmon. That's insane. <laughs> that's, that's way bigger I, than I, I thought. I can't imagine Atlantic salmon, like, being 109 pounds. So, yeah, that's... That's my fact. That's that's, that's interesting. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I, the only reason I knew this stuff about Scotland and this stuff is because I was watching, um, uh, what's his name? Jeremy Wade. Yes. And uh, River Monsters. And he was fishing, like, he was fishing somewhere over there in Scotland for these big Atlantic salmon. It's very cool. And I, I have to say, like, they have been coming back. I, I, I hear a lot of, like, conflicting opinions on if the MNR should continue to try to stock Atlantics because... It's not very successful from what I yeah. hear. Should, the, the, the should they put why, the money into other fish that would be better, like lake trout or like rainbows or salmon, maybe? Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know enough on the subject to speak There's on There's so much has changed with the Great Lakes since they were thriving that they just can't, the numbers can't get back like they were, right? Yeah. And plus, like, they introduced, like, all these Pacific salmon. Yeah. And it's just, it's a different lake than it was back in the 1800s obviously yeah. but it is nice to see them being caught in the fall yeah. like i've caught a few it's and cool just they're to fantastic at least have, even if they're not going to be in the same numbers to see them back and like to see the odd one i think it's it's great to still to still see around and but just remember if you preference. do catch one they are a catch and release only yes. fish in ontario in the creeks anyway i'm not sure with the lake but yeah so if you that was interesting learn how to identify them but what am yeah. i doing number number ratings yeah you're doing numbers. okay I'll, I'll give you a solid 8.9 Ooh, that's pretty good yeah I mean, it's no A plus like it's last like week. It's like an A minus. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that was interesting. I like these interesting fishing facts because they're all very Ontario based. Yes. Except for last week's, which was about you know Ohio, but don't worry about that. Yeah, but I use his lures in Ontario. Exactly, hundred oh. percent. So that was very interesting. Thank you, Andrew, for preparing that. Now our main topic of steelhead basics part two. We're gonna kind of cover more of the bait side of it, like the presentation side of it. If you listened to episode four, we kind of tried to cram everything in about where to fish, what rods to use, what baits. And we get a lot of questions on our Instagram all the time. I know a lot of people say that, but we actually do. I, I, I get a lot of messages all the time. 
And uh, it's a lot of them you are people. Here first, Jesse doesn't believe you when you say we get lots of questions. He's like, yeah, right. We get lots of questions. <laughs> it's just me <laughs> messaging myself. But I, we get a lot of messages from people that are just getting into the sport yeah. and they want to know, you know, what do I need? Do I need all this stuff? Because like you know, a lot of people bring a lot of stuff with them. So we're gonna kind of cover some of the bait, and uh, we're gonna talk about you know, actual bait, live bait. We're gonna talk about plastic bait, and we're gonna talk about hardware too. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna. T this is gonna kind of be from. A generalized steelhead from throughout the spring into after opener and the post spawn so it's going to cover from you know we're talking late february all the way into like late may so it's going to be very generalized and it's something that me and andrew have done a fair bit about especially um stream trout fishing for yeah. us anyway but we're going to start off with the most common and popular bait for steelhead fishing is roe or fish eggs um trout eggs salmon eggs you can get brook trout eggs all kinds of different eggs which the sponsor of our video fish heads he actually has different kinds of eggs because some people some anglers they are like they prefer like you know brook trout eggs and some of them prefer arctic char eggs yeah. and all these different kinds of eggs some people prefer brown trout eggs and to them that's the key and sometimes maybe it does work better but generally speaking i'd say the most popular two eggs to use is trout eggs and salmon eggs yeah and you can catch trout on salmon eggs and you can catch salmon on trout eggs. It, it, they're very similar. They're just different sizes. Yeah. The big, yeah, the biggest difference in size. But again, they're most popular in this area because that's what we're catching with them. So you exactly. can catch your own and you can cure your own as well. Yeah. So that's why it's it's very popular because guys that fish for them, they will oftentimes harvest, you know, a, a small hand or something like that. That gives them all the row they need or the skein that they need depending on what they've, what they've caught. And they'll use that for the season. And it's great bait. Like fresh yeah. eggs are amazing. My opinion is I feel like most of the time you don't need super fresh eggs to catch fish. When yeah. fish are biting, you can generally catch them on a really good prepared egg. Like the fish egg, the fish heads eggs, I've been using them the last few yeah. years. And the, the thing that I personally like about them, like we like to pair up with companies that we've already been dealing with for years. And, and you know, we're dealing with fish heads. I've been buying pre-packaged eggs from him for a few years now. I personally don't like, I used to, but I don't like killing hens if I, yeah. if I can help it. Cause like, to me, those are the fish that are going to lay the eggs to keep the populations up. Can you keep the fish? hundred percent. It's, it's your right. It's the law that you can keep, you know, I think it's one or two rainbows now. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd prefer not to. So what people ask, where are these eggs coming from? Well, they're, they're from eggs. Uh, the eggs are from farmed fish. So yep. it's very ethical. These fish are being, you know, they're processed not buying for food it from anyway. some guy on the street who just strung up 40, 40 trout I don't know, on a stringer hanging under a bridge. Yeah. So like they're, 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 they're ethical. So if, if you're the kind of person that wants to go fishing and you're like, you know what? I'm totally against killing a fish. If that's you, then you can 100% use fish heads row because it's from farmed fish that were, you know, used for food anyway. Mm -hmm. And then the eggs that are with the fish, it's actually processed or slightly cured they're not overly cured and then they're pre-packaged and they're fresh and you put them in your freezer what i do is i just you know i pull it out tie up a bunch of bags and when i'm done i just seal it back up put it in my freezer and then when i'm ready to go fishing the next time i just pull it out let them thaw out a bit you, you make them as you need them you don't have to have all this eggs where you have all this big process and maybe you're just starting out and you don't know how to cure eggs like maybe you caught a fish with eggs in it like that's daunting like if i told you right now andrew cure a bunch of eggs for me i'm gonna give you eggs what would you do <laughs> i throw a bunch of borax on it and ruin it <laughs> yeah so like do you cure it like a turkey tail <laughs> delicious because like curing eggs like i get a lot of questions about this too i'm not by far an expert i have been cure i've been curing eggs for you know more than a few years but it's very easy to mess up a cure you can over cure mm. your eggs and they literally become squishy balls that you can't even pop or you can under cure your eggs and then they rot so it is like I, it's happened to people. It's happened to me when you cure your eggs and you mess it up yeah. and then your eggs either rot or they're just, they're, they're not good. They're too hard. Even, even and how then they it's a cure, waste. if you're not experienced in it and you'll, you, you might be doing everything right. And because they cure, they, they release their juices, right? Yeah. And it'll soak them back in. So if you're doing it proper and you, you look and like all oh, the juices are gone, I ruined it. And you start adding more stuff, whatever. Now you're ruining it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's very easy to ruin eggs. Yeah. And if you know, it's an art form to do it right. Yeah. And like, there's so many different ways you can cure eggs. Um, and we're not really going to get into that. It's best if you want to know how to cure eggs, look up a good YouTube video on how to do it. Yeah. They'll explain it way better than I can on this podcast. But the good thing about fish head, fish heads row is it's already done. Yeah. It's already cured. It's, it's good quality. 
and you just literally just scoop it into your, your netting, tie it up the size that you want, the color that you want, the, the type of eggs that you want, and that's it. And it's not that expensive. And I, and I do like to, because you still tie your own netting, like the eggs having been cured is a great stage because now if I only want, let's say it's salmon eggs, I only want like three or four. I want a small bag or I want to have like a bunch in there. I want to make big bags for, for floating off the bottom. It's, I can tie whoever I want in my own bag now it's not like i get them pre-tied for me in, in a tackle store or something like that again that's another option but yeah you get one size and it's like well i, I want it's a medium size i wanted them smaller i wanted them bigger i wanted them yeah. different so here you still get to have make your own kind of you're not having to cure it but you can make your own bag size you have you can dial it in for your preferences still exactly and and it's cost effective so like obviously getting your own row is the most cost effective um but buying them at the store pre-tied is the most expensive. And yeah. usually they're not the best. Um, Those bags fall open. And <laughs> yeah, they're not the best. So another thing too is if you are ordering some stuff from Fish Heads and you get the eggs, uh, you can order the you know the mesh and the thread and everything you need on his site if you yeah. want to um, and support a local business there. But anyway, that's what we do for Roe. Again, we're not diehard steelhead guys. A lot of guys will say they don't like packaged stuff. That it has to be fresh or they like it a certain way. But if you're just getting into steelhead fishing, Package row is completely fine. It works great for me. Catches fish. It's good quality stuff. Definitely check it out. Um, beads. Beads. So I'm not that old. I only use the purest Mojave glass beads. <laughs> like, what? I have no clue what he's talking kidding. about. <laughs> but anyway, so when it comes to beads, I remember when I started steelhead fishing like a long time ago. Like, I think I was like, you know, 13, 14 years old. And beads were kind of just like starting to be popular. And my dad, my dad would steelhead fish, but he, he wasn't a steelhead guy. He, he was a trout yeah. fisherman. He, you know, he'd catch them on, you know, spinners and, you know, dew worms and stuff like that. It's like, I didn't really have any experience at all with like fishing steelhead for, with like beads and like plastics and stuff. So when beads started becoming popular, I was literally like, I was like a skeptic, just like I am now. I'm like, that's stupid. I was like, no <laughs> fish is going to eat a plastic ball. That's stupid. But. Again, it was popular, so I went to the store. I remember the first bead I bought, I bought a Kite Fish Chartreuse uh, 10 millimeter bead. It was a bigger bead. And I put it on and I drifted it through a pool. And in just a few drifts, I caught one. My float popped under and I set the hook and boom, it was, it was fish. And I was like, my mind was blown. I was like, these work? <laughs> and then after that, it was like my main thing I'd use. The, the reason beads are so good is because it's so natural. Yes. Like explain why, Andrew, like, you know, like why would someone choose a single bead in clear water over like a big bag of roe. So it all's about the natural presentation of it. So if you have, if a trout dies upstream or a trout is spawning upstream, let's say, they're releasing all these loose eggs into the bottom and some will float downstream. So you have these single loose eggs floating downstream. You're not having a clump of eggs like wrapped in a skein essentially floating downstream. That's that's unnatural. It has a lot of scent. So in, in really muddy water and stuff like that, it has benefit. but. If it's gin clear water and a trout just sees like a mass of eggs flowing at it, it's completely unnatural. It's going to avoid that like the plague. Yeah, <laughs> but especially it has, in pressured water. Yeah. And it's it's seen, again, it's, it's the most popular. So it's seen them a hundred times on its journey up this creek in the past like three days, yeah. at least. But you get this small little, little bead coming along that looks exactly like uh, a, a small trout egg. It's It's seeing those and it's been eating them and it's having no issues eating them the whole time. So that it's such a natural presentation of it. Just one small bead coming along. It's non imposing whatsoever. They're going to, they're going to take that. Exactly. It's just like instinct for them to see that and be like, yep, that's fine. Yeah. They'll take it without even thinking about it yeah. to them. It's like the most natural thing. And like you said, there's fish spawning everywhere. There's, you know, dead fish sometimes with dead eggs. And there's, it's such a natural presentation as an egg. And like in clear water, you can't go wrong with a small bead too, yeah. like a six millimeter. Start at eight. That's kind of where you start. And then if the water's a little bit murky, go up to a 10 millimeter. If the water's clear, go down to a six. That's what I do. And it works out pretty good. And you hear trout guys, like when you're fishing like trout in, in the later months, they'll say, oh, match the hatch. Or even, you know, fishing for anything, match the hatch. If there's, you know, stonefly nymphs that are in the water, you're going to fish a stonefly nymph. You're going to catch more fish. Matching the hatch during the spawn is there's going to be eggs in the water. Fish, fish, a bead, fish, an egg imitation. Yeah. And, and one pro for beads, because like beads are great. Sometimes 
row bags will outproduce them 100%, yep. especially when you know you need some extra scent or the water's a bit murky and you need a bigger presentation. But one of the great things about using beads and plastics for that matter is, you know, you can just leave them in your bag. <laughs> you buy a bunch of beads, put them in a little container or a bunch of bags of pink worms and just chuck them in your fishing bag and just leave them. You don't have to worry about them rotting, going bad, you know, smelling bad. Just keep them in there and generally speaking, if you're just going fishing and you don't want to use like, you know, a live or live bait or like, you know, row, you don't have to worry about it. You just put it in your bag and you're done. And they work. They catch fish. Beads are great. And there's different kinds of beads. We got into that kind of in episode four. There's glass beads. There's acrylic beads. Different, you know, patterns. There's ones with dots on them. All kinds of colors. There's glow beads. And Generally then, speaking. You know, there's there's like the, the dead the dead egg beads are like white, right? So it's, yep. it's mimicking uh even they might not look like a natural color but it's mimicking the different stages of an egg that'd be floating downstream and i a hundred percent we have a video on our youtube channel yeah. the, the dead egg bite and if you're fishing like an off white bead or a cream colored bead or a white bead late season like when the fish are like kind of done spawning because like you have to think a, a trout egg coming out of a trout as they're spawning and it's tumbling downstream in cold water those eggs turn white mm -hmm. if you get any egg and put it in cold water like a trout egg they turn white because they're not cured, obviously. So that white egg, or like a, a light-colored egg, and it's not fermentation. So it's it's dead now. That's why yeah, it goes. It's perfect. It literally it's great. And, and after opener, the white egg bite for me, it's just it's been fantastic. And again, too, because steelhead are coming back, those eggs are filled with protein. Like for yeah. them, that's that's energy for them that they need after expending themselves getting all the way up that creek. So they start engorging themselves on the way back down to the lake. Or, or you know, or the ocean, whatever. So they start feeding on whatever they can, and those eggs are filled with nutrition for them. So 100%, that's a great way to get them. 100%. So like, you know, you got row and beads which imitate eggs, and then we're gonna go on to uh, plastics. So like plastics, like we said, one of the most popular steelhead baits is the pink worm, a and they're great. That color, just something about it, the steelhead love it. And I don't know if it has to do with visibility because it's not really a natural color to a fish, like bright and mm -hmm. pink. But I've also done well on, uh, uh, like, a uh, kite fish has a, a, a transparent red one. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like a red wiggler, but it's slightly transparent. And in gin clear water, that one has done very well for me. But they come in all different colors. You can get, you know, everything. Black, you know, olive, like, doesn't matter. Pick the color that, you know, you have confidence in. But generally start with pink. Pink's a great color. Mm -hmm. Even in clear water, it works good. And you fish it the same way you fish row. Just fish it under your float. Try to get it, you know, in front of the fish's face. And I mean, it works for every other species like panfish and walleye. I mean, it's going to work for steelhead. They, they seem to like just love pink worms. I don't know why. It's like candy to them. <laughs> for sure. And then you have, you know, there's a lot of ones. You have the pink worms, which is a nice soft plastic bait. But then you have other soft plastic baits too. You can get little nymphs uh, yep. in soft plastic. You can get, you can even fish uh, small flukes and stuff if you wanted to, especially in the post spawn. Again, they're, they're, they're foraging little minnows and stuff like that even. So yeah. you could fish, you can fish any small kind of drop shot bait that you're looking for a crappy bait, technically could work. But pink worms in general, that's, again, it's it's something more that they're likely to see in the creek that they'd be more apt to to go and take. And like you said, the, the, the little nymphs are very popular. And I know a lot of guys are like, don't tell my secret. It's not a secret. It's common knowledge pretty if much. If you go in the steelhead section, you'll see nymphs there. Yeah. It's not a secret. All the guys make them now. Even Z-Man makes those little nymphs now. Yeah. But I've done pretty well with a little... Uh, they used to sell them just for ice fishing. I remember one yeah. of the brands made like a little like power ice nymph and I've used it for steelhead fishing in really clear water because it was a smaller bait and it worked really good. Don't be afraid to experiment with weird baits because steelhead, like they're big fish, they need to eat. If it looks yeah. natural, they're going to eat it. Yep. So, and if you're using something that no one else is using, you have a big advantage. 100%. Big. Uh, the next thing is flies. Now, we're not generally talking about fly fishing. Um, but the same principle applies because it's just a different way to present the fly. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're more talking about float fishing with flies under a float. And flies that are classic for steelhead fishing, the woolly bugger. Yeah. That's a classic. Nymphs like the hare's ear nymph, uh, prince, nymph, prince nymph, stuff like that. Yeah. I like the prince nymph because that one with the bead head. Uh, and if, you tie, if you're tying your own, you can even use like a tungsten bead, stuff like that, which brings it down deeper if you're fishing like faster current. Yeah, for sure. And so it's like got like that. the little lead wrapped body. Yeah. I've done good on those. Copper Johns. A, a pheasant tail. Yeah. Just something small natural. Like I used to tie pheasant tails. And like once you get good at tying them, you could tie a pheasant tail in like 60 seconds. So I'd literally go through in an hour and just tie a whole bunch of them. You even have the the, the red 
the red worm flies, right? They got a bead and a little bit of yep. red Which yarn. Is pretty, pretty much, much the same it. as using a pink worm. Yeah. yeah. But again, fly guys fly say they're flies. But yeah. <laughs> believe me, they're not flies. They're worms. <laughs> a lot of these flies are tied onto jig, jig hooks. Head. Yeah, they're tied yeah. on jig hooks, right? Definitely. So you can buy them at the store. I recommend to people if, if you're going steelhead fishing, if you don't, if you're not really into flies, buy a few, try them out, see if you like it. I've had a few situations where I've been fishing, especially in really clear water and my buddy's fishing and I'm fishing with beads like you know like beads they work great my buddy's fishing a fly and he just spanks me like literally just just fish after fish and they just <laughs> wanted that specific fly like a stone fly or you know a woolly bugger or something like that and it's just that change in presentation that the fish just for some reason really wanted so it's one of those things like if you're not really into it that's fine but have a few just in case. Yeah. And the thing is too, you don't need a fly rod to fish the flies. Like you said, you fish them under a float, you can fish them on, if you have a center pin, that's great. But like we talked about in the first episode on steelhead is if you only have like a spinning reel, stuff like that to go with, go for it, that's fine. You can still fish the flies underneath your float. A fly is not really any any lighter than like a, a small bead on a hook. Right? Exactly. A hook. Yeah. So you're gonna be fine fishing that regardless. Anything that looks buggy. I yeah. tell people that. I know the, the marabou jigs, I'm not sure how popular they are anymore in stores, but I know they used to be there's a little bee head and yep. yeah, just a tuft marabou on the hook. I actually have a story about that. So I think it was two years ago, I was I was still at fishing and it was one of those creeks where you have to walk a long you know time between pools. And it was after opener and I was walking and walking. The water is low and there's no fish. I was getting like so frustrated. I was like, man, I've walked like three, four kilometers. I, I've seen like one fish. And then I got to this pool and a bunch of trees had had fallen down across this pool and kind of dammed up a little corner. So it was like nice and deep. And all these fish were stacked in this pool. It was just like, they were all there. It was like 40 of them, big rainbows, small ones all mixed together. And uh, I was just like, oh, like this is perfect. So I was like, you know, sneaking up. And, and the guy uh, with his gun came out and said, get off my property. <laughs> yeah, not, not this time. That's another story. But uh, the... I had a bead on and I, w I went through the pool and I actually caught like four or five right away, like in 10 minutes on beads. And then the fish were like, you know, when you catch one fish and it's, it was a small pool and it was just freaking out and spinning and all yeah. the fish kind of just like, you know, they started getting a little bit spooked and I, I couldn't catch them on a bead. So I tied on one of those little puffy marabou ones. It was white and it had a little bit of peach in it mm -hmm. and I drifted it down and you could see it cause it's a big, basically a fluff ball, like floating <laughs> down. And I just saw a fish just like open its mouth and eat it. And I set the hook and it was a big hen. And like I, I caught a bunch of fish on flies and that really made me a believer on those specific flies. Yeah. Cause like sometimes you just don't have confidence in a bait cause you never caught a fish on it. But if That's the fish are biting, tackle box. <laughs> yeah, but if the fish are <laughs> biting, attacking me, Jesse. put on something different just to get confidence in that bait. Yeah. Cause it can be fantastic. The fly bite can be amazing. hundred percent. All right. Next one. And we covered this a bit in our last podcast is live bait. Mm -hmm. Now, again, not as popular. Um, you can use minnows and, you know, worms like live worms. And we're mostly gonna talk about worms. If you're a beginner and you wanna get into steelhead fishing and you're fishing like say after opener, find some nice deep holes or some nice corners. If you wanna fish a dew worm or a little red wiggler yep. on a, you know, a simple, you know, number six or eight hook. Yeah, hook it once to the head and just let it Yeah, One or two split shot, just let yep. it tumble through the current. You'll catch fish. What, what, what does your grandpa always say? Let it drift. Let it drift. <laughs> My grandpa would always say that. He'd say, let it drift. and that's all you have to do and, and yeah. you log jam and you watch you just let that worm drift right back under it and the yeah. current will take it right down into it and now you'll snap off but worms are cheap and so are hooks so you know but then you get drift let it drift into there and then all of a sudden your line will just tighten and your rod will start to you know <laughs> buck and now you gotta <gasps> hope for the best you can pull out this you know 20 plus inch steelhead out of this log jam <laughs> yeah <laughs> upstream <laughs> and you know i've had some fantastic days usually after opener in deep log jams like andrew said and you know you're going to want to use pretty sturdy equipment yeah. uh, i like to use at least eight or ten pound mono because you're pulling fish out under logs they're jumping all the water over yeah. logs and like it's a it's a fiasco almost mm -hmm. so definitely they work they're great the, the main problem i find with worms is the fish oftentimes swallow them yeah. and you'll gut hook them so one is one thing that i've been doing the last few years is i've been using circle hooks and if you're not familiar with the circle hook, Andrew's going to tell you what they are. Yeah, so circle hooks are, are really cool. So they, uh, on most hooks you think of where the point and the barb is, is pointing exactly parallel with the shank, pretty much. It, or at least parallel with your line. What a circle hook does is it actually keeps bending in further. So it's uh, not quite, but it's closer to perpendicular with your line, the very tip of that hook. 
So what happens is, as a fish, it'll swallow it, and instead of just setting the hook hard, what you do is you reel in so your line is tight, and as that circle hook is coming outside of that fish's mouth, it'll hook onto the ridge of bone on the outside of their mouth. And that's where the tip will hook onto, and then it turns in, and then will start to engage. And it locks in. Like it when locks you hook a fish in. on a circle hook, it's not coming so off. So you don't, you don't set the hook when you're using a fish uh, circle hook. What you do is you just slowly reel in, tighten that line, and it will hook itself. Yeah, and they, they work great. Um, yeah. I've had success using them for steelhead. I also use them for bass too, if I'm using live bait. They're fantastic. I actually really like, if you're taking a kid fishing for the first time, I I, I like to use circle hooks and I tell them, you don't set the hook. Because oftentimes the little children, they don't have the, the mechanics down they, of setting the hook. They don't the set hook. a hook anyways. <laughs> like you take a little kid fishing for sunfish with a bobber and what do they do when the bobber goes under? They just reel. Yeah. And with a circle hook, that's perfect. Yep. The fish is hooked. And guess what? Sunfish doesn't swallow your hook and you're not killing you know, a little sunfish for no yeah. reason. So try a circle hook if you're using live bait. Um, another bait that I didn't we didn't mention in the plastics, and this is like a little bit of a secret, but a uh, little tube jig, yeah. like a crappy tube jig. I've had fantastic days on those. And you can fish them under a float. The, pro here, the thing like you were saying with the crankbaits in the last episode, you can't use a legit crappy jig head because the hooks are thin. Yeah. Steelhead will bend that out, no problem. So you actually have to use a legit strong gauge hook like a steelhead jig yep. but put a little tube jig those little crappy tube jigs i've had really good success with a bunch of colors but the pearl white ones i'll fish it under a float really good or after opener if you're fishing deep holes you can literally almost like just pitch it into holes let it sink to the bottom and then just twitch it up just you know twitch it off the bottom yep. and i've had fish just dart out and grab it and then immediately lose that them in a log like a jam. fantastic bfs technique we should try you should i want to weird bfs bfs for steelies Oh, you know how many times you're going to be snapping <laughs> your line? But anyway, as we've discussed, there's so many different baits and lures. Um, lures we kind of covered in, in episode four, but the main ones that I talk about is spinners, spoons, and crankbaits. Yep. And my favorite way to catch a fish like on a, on a in the creeks is a spinner. That's, that's my favorite. A little Panther Martin or a little Mex. 100%. I love, I love Panther, Panther Martins. Martins because they get deep in yes. current. Yes. Sometimes if you're using like a, a Meps Aglia, they, they, they hold too high in the water column because the blade configuration, it just catches too much water. So the Panther Martin runs off. It's called a commonly called a sonic blade, uh, like style blade. And so the there's no hinge that it's revolving around. The blade's revolving around on. So that's like a French spinner, uh, like your classic maps and stuff like that. So you'll see a little bracket that the blade is attached to. That bracket is on the shaft. Mm -hmm. With a sonic, the shaft passes directly through the spinner blade. So with that, it stays a lot tighter to the spinner body. So that's why it does track deeper. It doesn't have as much water it's moving, and it causes a lot more vibration because the blade is rattling against that shaft. And they're they're great. I've caught more steelhead on panther martens than any other herd bait, I think. Another great lure I've caught a lot of fish on is little Cleos, like little, small little Cleos. The old, uh, I think it was the, uh, the MEPS Little Wolfie. Yep, Those Little Wolf. Little Wolf. You so can find them. I haven't seen the, them recently. Yeah, I haven't seen them in stores in a while, but you can still pick them up. And they, they were good because they were... They were pretty heavy. Same with the crocodile spoons. If you mm -hmm. if you want a spoon that'll get deeper, the crocodile spoons you can get them, and they're in these nice small sizes, and they're thick, they're like the thickness of a little Cleo, like what you'd cast for salmon, but it's like trout size. Yeah. And those things will get deep in a pool real fast. And, and I think a lot of people, especially when you start steelhead fishing, they think that you have to be uber finesse when you're steelhead fishing. Like after opener, when these fish are hungry, yeah. like they've been there. These fish normally live in the lake, and they feed on you know owl life and other like bait fish. And then they go up a creek where there's not much food. Mm -hmm. So they're they're hungry. They're, they're, they got to eat. They're not just starving themselves like salmon, right? So like if you chuck out a little minnow bait, a little crank bait or jerk bait yeah. or a spinner spoon, to them, that's or just natural. The banana baits. I mean, that, that's, the flat that's an old one, right? The flatfish. Or the quick fish, yeah. Yeah, so that, I mean, that used to be a secret decades ago, but... It's not anymore. It's not anymore. But not a lot of people fish them. Yes. Like it's crankbaits have fallen out of fashion again for, for the steelhead. So again, all these steel that are coming in, they've never seen them before. Yeah. There's a good chance they haven't seen many at least. So And, yeah, and again, some guys fish different. them religiously. Yep. A lot of people don't. Yep. So I'd say that like the, the main thing I don't like about fishing with crankbaits is most crankbaits that I want to fish are expensive now. Yeah. They're like 10 bucks. And if you're fishing around log gyms and stuff, you're going to lose a lot of them. Yeah. So it's like, I'd rather lose like, you know, a $5 spinner. If I can get like a blue fox on sale for like one dollar bead and hook, yeah, yeah. But they, there's so many different presentations, and again, we're gonna plug our sponsor of the of the podcast, Fishheads. Yeah, he has a lot of the stuff that you're gonna need, a lot of the baits, the plastics. He stocks all the the popular stuff. And those are those are the traditional baits. Like when when 
we talk about using a spinner, using a crankbait, so with that, those are they work, but they're I would consider them non-traditional steelhead baits. So anything like traditional steelheading, fishhead has. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we didn't mention what the giveaway was. So Fishheads Canada is giving away fifty dollars. I, I was gonna make a joke there, but I I, I couldn't think of anything funny. Okay. But <laughs> I was gonna say he's giving away all all the stuff that didn't sell. He's giving away to you to try. No, you get to choose exactly what you want. So if and you can try all the beads that are purple and yeah. <laughs> yellow. No, but uh, Fishheads is giving away fifty dollars, and that's a yeah. fantastic giveaway. And that's that's a good chunk of money that you can buy. You know, maybe some supplies, some fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon's expensive. Fluorocarbon yep. leaders. You can yep. pick up some beads, some plastic bait. You can buy some of his row if you've never tried it. If you win this giveaway, definitely pick up a pack of that because yep. that stuff's fantastic. For fifty bucks, you can get kind of a starter pack for yourself where you can go with your spinning rod that you have now and go out there and try steelheading. If you want to get into it, this is now, uh, you know nothing down steelhead experience you can you can go and try it so that's fantastic for sure and if say you're already a guy and you have everything you're a guy or a girl that has a lot of this stuff then you know get exactly yourself, what you want get yourself get a nice hat or get yourself a nice yeah. pair of hemostats like get yourself something nice that you normally wouldn't get yeah and you'll love it but anyway that's a fantastic giveaway we like to thank him for that we've had really good giveaways on this podcast so it's far been, it's been amazing i've been really support. happy with yeah. the support from the local guys and we're trying to get you know mostly local guys and girls it's been fantastic so that giveaway, awesome, 50 bucks, that's amazing. Now, we're gonna go quickly through um, gear for beginners. This is a basic video. So like, Andrew's gonna handle the hardware bit and I'm gonna handle the float fishing bit. So why don't you go first? Like, Say you're a beginner, someone's like, hey, I'm just, I wanna chuck some spinners, spoons, or crankbaits down mm -hmm. at the creek. What are you gonna recommend to them? So I would say- And we're talking like wide ranges, not Niagara, but like not yeah. little creeks, so like just in general. So I would for my preference, I like to go a little bit heavier on the rod just because again, you don't want something too heavy where you can't fight the fish. You want to have that flexibility. So I'd say a, a medium light spinning rod. Uh, longer the better. So because yeah. you want to get the reach in the, in the creek. So if you have, let's say, you know, your your bass rod for, for in the summer, you have like a, a seven foot medium light. Take that down or even medium. Medium works Medium is well. fine, yeah. Medium will work. Um, so if, let's say you're, you're seven foot medium, go down to the creek and you have some 10 pound mono and you put a tie on uh you know a, a 10 foot liter of of some seven pound fluoro or six pound fluoro whatever you you can muster up out of either the giveaway that you win or from your local tackle shop and then right away you have a combo you can open the the spool if you need to let it drift it's is it as ideal as a center pin no but if you're starting out you're not going to go buy a 500 hundred dollar center pin reel and a 300 dollar center pin rod and be like i want to see if i like this yeah <laughs> So, you know, try it out with, with something like a lot of the, I don't, I've gone out with my, uh, item medium heavy. I used for a long time, medium heavy spinning rod. Most ideal. Absolutely not. But I was also, I was able, I was able to land some steelhead. So, and especially when you're fishing, uh, spinners and stuff like that, it's an easy rod and reel to cast. Uh, it's easy to, to retie it. If you run into issues, you're not going to have like a backlash in the Creek with a spinning reel. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's probably your your best run of the mill thing i would suggest to get started into it because you can then fish a float on it you can easily fish and cast your spinner your crankbait and it's probably worm. something you already own exactly you probably yeah. already own like a medium spinning so combo. that's like your most budget you know thing to get started into it because either if you don't have a rod get that because you can use it all summer long <laughs> yeah as well or if you already have it use that exactly and if you want to get a little more advanced a great rod for fishing, like hardware, spinner, spoons, crankbaits. I have a nine foot six medium light um, spinning rod. And I'll pair that with a 4,000, Shimano 4,000. And I'll load that up with, you know, 10, eight, 10 pound mono. And the bigger reel is great, not just for, it's not like you need the capacity of, it's, you know, you're in a creek and especially the East Trib, something like that. You're not having this thing run two kilometers downstream on you. Yeah. But smoother the, drag the drag is what you want yeah. so it's a it's a bigger drag system it's going to operate smoother because these fish they fight and you want it to take that drag off smoothly so it's not putting that stress and going to snap you off because you're going to be using a light leader most likely yeah and the the thing is too a 4000 is great because if you're going to go shore casting yeah. the same combo works great for chucking little cleos yep now Passing again for salmon a medium light you could also <laughs> go medium i mean i like a medium light because 
it does offer you that extra reach. The longer rod gives you more reach. So you can help you swing mm -hmm. around the, you know, different holes and around logs and stuff. And then the medium light gives you some shock absorption for when you're fishing, maybe lay, layer line, like eight pound test. Mm -hmm. So that would be in ideal situations for me. I'd recommend anything between eight and nine and a half to 10 feet long would yeah. be great. If, but, if you were using a heavier rod, uh, my recommendation would be for the line is I'd have your main line be mono because as we learned in the line episode, mono will give you that stretch instantaneously. So as soon as any pressure is exerted on the mono section of your line, it's gonna start stretching and give a bit more flexibility overall on that fighting distance. Whereas fluoro won't start to stretch until half of its weight rating is, is exerted on it. So you're again, you're not gonna need, you're not fishing crazy far. So the mono is not gonna hinder your sensitivity at that range. But it could give that more elasticity if you do have a heavier rod. Or something stiffer. Or yeah. stuffing stiffer. Mono will help compensate as well. And mono is my choice. If I'm fishing spinners, I, I like an 8 or 10 pound uh, copolymer line. And that for me is fine. Some guys like braid. That's fine too. Um, and then gear for like float fishing, like we mentioned. If you want more information about the float fishing side of it, check out our episode 4, Steelhead Fishing Basics Part yep. 1. And, you know, we're talking about 11 to 13 foot medium light light medium light float rod and uh i get a lot of people uh, like different things on their float reel if you're using a float reel you can put anything between 8 and 20 pound line on it yeah. i generally like 10 or 12 and then your leader is just going to be lighter so if you want I'm, more information on that we're not going to go in depth on that for this i'm just episode. nodding because i don't own a float reel i'm like yes that sounds right yeah <laughs> As long as your main line is heavier than your leader line, you're yes. good. I don't like it to be too close. Like if you're using six pound leaders, you don't want to use an eight pound main line because that's very close. Yeah. I don't want to ever snap off my float if I get a snag. So I'm always going to have at least 10 or 12. I actually like 12. Yep. And then I'll use six pound leaders. Again, no the fish problem. aren't seeing that 12 pound line at all. No. You're, they're seeing your leader that you have tied on after. Exactly. So it can be 12. And, and main lines that I like, and I know a lot of guys like, Suffix Siege. I like Suffix Advance. It's a copolymer. A lot of guys... You know, like you don't need expensive mainline. Uh, I've kind of gone away from using the big box pools of the cheap float fishing float line, yeah. but some people like it. So what can I do? Because you know, as Jesse said in previous episodes, is you know, fluoro for steelhead. A lot of steelhead guys they swear by. It. You ask them what they're using, they're going to be running fluoro on mm -hmm. the on at least on the leader. Yeah. But again, the fish are seeing your first at most six to ten feet of at most six to ten feet of line. So. Anything most above you that? Need six to ten feet of fluoro, and the rest can be high you know, vis, high visibility, whatever yeah. you want. And a lot of people like. And it's going to be a vis. lot cheaper to spool your rod, up, spool your reel up with that. Hundred percent. So you, it doesn't have to be complicated. I think a lot of people when they get into steelhead fishing, they think it, you know these fish are so smart, they're so hard to catch. They're not. It's just there is a learning curve, like we mentioned. There's a learning curve, and the gear and how to use the gear and how to present it in current. It's a little bit complicated at first, but once you get that down, it doesn't take long. You can, I know people that start steelhead fishing in that year and the next year, they're slamming fish. Yeah. Because if you do your homework and, and you know, maybe you have a buddy that is really good at steelhead fishing and takes you out, you can get on fish. That's Jesse to me. Yeah. So when, when Jesse, when we were young and we'd like write letters to each other because we were also pen pals who lived like an hour away and at the time we couldn't drive. So, yeah. But, you know, Jesse would be telling me about, you know, steelhead fishing in the spring and, and he's like, oh yeah, fishing a bead or, you know, drifting, floating pink worms. I'm like, okay, like what's that? I, I, I could not comprehend it. And he'd tell me, he's like, oh, you should go out, you know, I can't go fishing with it, but you should go out fishing for steelhead. Like I have no idea where to begin. So I never did it until Jesse's like, okay, we're going out steelhead fishing. We went out together and that was the first time I ever did it. And I'm, I'm glad I was with someone who knew what he was doing. And again, Jesse will tell you, he's not like a professional, but at least he's had experience on the creek. He, he at least knows the techniques and whatnot, especially at the time. So for me, I was able to just have a visual, you know, ideas to how it's done. Because watching YouTube videos, I mean, they're really they're informative, um, 100%. Watch them before you go out, because the more you can learn, the better. But when I was starting out, I didn't have YouTube videos to go watch. Like YouTube was around, but it wasn't populated with yeah. good quality videos to actually learn from and speaking of good quality videos we have a steelhead fishing basics video on youtube that has over 800 thumbs up on it so it must be good so check that out <laughs> yeah so yeah if you can get someone who uh, you know doesn't mean you have to pay for a i mean if you go with a guide you're going to learn a lot you're going to year, learn years of information if you go with a guide yeah if you go with someone who at least you know that's their hobby to do it you're going to 
take a lot of the pain of trying to figure this stuff out for yourself out of the equation. So you're going to get more enjoyment out of it because fishing these things was a lot different than what I had expected of, of drifting, knowing how to drift, how to, where to set your bait in the water column, how to properly weight your line. It's, it's a lot. It is, especially if you're just coming in as a beginner. Yeah. It's a lot to take in. But thankfully, there's a lot of information out there. Yeah. And, and it's become popular, so there is a lot of content. Exactly. So it's not something that's impossible to learn. Like yeah. I always say to people, and fishing it's worth it to learn. is a learnable skill. Yes. I'm not saying you're going to be like Kevin Van Dam, but it's a learnable skill. Does you he can... catch a lot of steelhead? <laughs> I don't know if he's even caught one. Those bass guys, they can't catch steelhead. Just kidding. <laughs> anyway, so that's... That's kind of what we wanted to cover today is more of the bait stuff. Again, as we always say, if you have any questions that we can answer, we're happy to help. Yeah. Um, send us a message on Instagram. Now we're going to do the giveaway. And then after the giveaway, we have A and A. What? A and A? AOA Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> so our giveaway for the Fish Heads $50 promo code for his website. And we got quite a few people we're yeah. not going to say how many because i forget it's how many into it the was. doubles of digits oh yeah it's actually <laughs> it's quite a bit i mean yeah. like obviously if you have the opportunity to win 50 dollars of still fishing money a lot of people entered which is fantastic 100%. and that's what this is all about so andrew has what's it called the wheel of names wheel of names the yeah. wheel of names and he's gonna spin it all right he's gonna spin it right now whoever wins this you can hear it spinning there he's gonna win 50 dollars And the winner is... It's easy to say. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> Nature Daddies. Nature Daddies. Oh. Congratulations to Nature Daddies. I'm not joking. There was a few names on there that I really wanted the person to win just because their name was hard to pronounce and Andrew would have to say it. But Nature Daddies. I would apologize profusely before attempting to, and I would not try and do bad on it, but I, I inevitably would. <laughs> Thankfully, I know how to pronounce those two words. <laughs> I met Nature Daddies at um, Peter Young's uh, kayak meetup. Yeah. And... Uh, the paddle sport meetup and he's a nice guy so i'm actually happy that he won but <laughs> yeah good for him he's also a guy that you know he still has fishes he does really good so yeah. i'm glad that he won it uh if you didn't win the giveaway use that money for sure yeah for sure but if you didn't win the giveaway guess what there's another one next week and the next week and the next week we're doing a giveaway every single week with local companies yeah which is fantastic so now we're gonna do aoa q a and andrew has the questions all right. And he's going to decide which one to give me and which one to answer himself. All right. So. Not that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I would say the first one. Favorite brand of hook or terminal tackle? Hmm. That's a good one because there's so many good brands. Um, let's let's go with hooks because that was. Okay. I mean, so terminal hooks. tackle is like a bunch of stuff. But let's go yeah, with, yeah. with Okay. Hooks, let's then. go with hooks. So like just for general fishing i've really fallen in love with and i think they're really underrated is the berkeley fusion 19 hooks nice. like if, if i'm buying a flipping hook or like um just replacement trebles those hooks are sticky sharp and they're really reasonably priced like i've gone through buying you know gamakatsu and owner and all the different hooks and they're all great yeah. but those hooks for the money i feel like they're the best value and i recommend them to everyone yeah. like when i replace hooks on my jerk baits i buy those yeah for me i would say Again, like a lot of the hooks I replace are on my jerk baits or crank baits, and I love the Gamakatsu finesse treble hooks. Oh, they're amazing! I love the G things. finesse. And, yeah. yeah. So I, when I find them and they they go on sale the odd time, and I'll buy like a couple sizes and I'll buy two packs of each, of each size going up for my to put on my crank baits because I love it because they're as strong or stronger than like the regular Rapala hooks and stuff that come naturally, uh, or come naturally <laughs> they come provided on the baits. But then they're also like thinner gauge. So they, they're sticky sharp. They easily penetrate. And then they're stronger than and they're, the stock hooks. They have a coating on them, which yeah. makes them slick. And a cool thing that I haven't tried them yet because they just came out is VMC. I'm also a fan of VMC hooks. Yeah. They actually have a new series of hooks coming out. And it's probably available sometime in the spring. They're yeah. called the Redline series, I think. And they're Teflon coated hooks. Ooh. So they look really good. And I noticed a lot of the pros like Seth Fighter and stuff have been, you know, showing them on their instagram but they look really good and they have like flipping hook nico hooks like all the different hooks and they're teflon coated and they come with like a really cool storage system that's built into the pack nice that like clips all the hooks together they look fantastic like i'm sure the regular hooks are good so i'm sure these are amazing so yeah. we're looking forward to trying that but yeah yeah i'd have to say those brands are awesome all right uh this one here 
I'll take this one because it's a funny one. Okay. What? <laughs> this is from. Uh, oh, so the last one was from Jake Leeson, uh, twenty-seven. So this one here is from Lip Ripping Podcast. Okay. And what stank do you prefer on your jeans? Largemouth bass or big slimy northern pikes? And I have to say, I prefer big slimy northern pikes. Really? <laughs> so I know Jesse. <laughs> Jesse, like, there's a few pictures of him floating around online. I'm sure of him just nose deep in the gullet of largemouth bass, and he's like. Ah, nostalgia. I love the smell of a good largemouth bass. <laughs> it's it's good. But for me, growing up, having a slimy pike like on my hands and on my jeans and stuff like that puts me in the cottage where I'm you'll attest to this. We used yeah. to go wake up early in the morning, drive up river, like it would take us forever. Oh, well, we'd <laughs> paddle, not we'd drive. Paddle. Yeah. Or when we did it was like a trolling motor with like an extra battery and it'd take us forever to get up river. We'd pick up these homemade Chelsea buns from a local store. Oh yeah. And then eat them on the way back and Inevitably, we'd be catching pike the whole time, and those Chelsea buns tasted better with pike slime on our hands than without. Somehow, say you say that, but <laughs> I just think it's because pike I think are it was so just because slimy. It was good to eat Chelsea buns while fishing, so it didn't matter if it was pike slime or not. Yeah, but pike are so slimy, right? Like, yeah, it's they have so much slime on them compared to a bass. It's like when you have pike slime on your hands, you wipe it on your pants. It's just so much. Yeah, and I think that's the one thing that I don't like. But like. They do, they have, it's a very nostalgic smell. Yes. I know like if you don't fish, you won't understand that when you pick, I, I always remember, this is a story about my dad. My dad took me trout fishing since I was like four years old. And, and one time I remember I was a little bit older and we went to a creek that was near his house where he grew up in and he caught this brown trout and he, he put it up to his face and he smelled it. He like, you know, like nice yeah. big smell. And I was like, why do you do that? And he's like, you wouldn't understand. Like it's nostalgic. You'll, you'll understand when you're older. And I was like, weirdo. <laughs> And then, late, like, literally, do it recently. And now I'm just Jesse, like, yeah. Jesse sniffs the first fish of every season. He's oh, yeah. like, sometimes oh. I kiss them too. <laughs> Not pike though. But anyway, yeah, that, that's a good question. All right, and then we have. All right, have you ever had trouble with the wardens, the game wardens? That's from uh, Laurent S. Est de la Flu. I don't speak French, so that's as good as you're getting. Okay, uh, I haven't. Have you? I've never had trouble with them. I've I've seen them a couple times only. Again, like I, I know it, that's a whole other discussion, but there's not many. There's really, not many for, or, for the amount of space of of water and hunting areas. Like they cover it all in MNR. I've only and been these approached. Game wardens, they, they're they're spread so thin. Oh yeah. Yeah, you're hard pressed to find them. I've only been approached by game wardens, and I I fished a considerable amount of times yeah. over the last you know years, twice. Yeah. And once was when I was ice fishing. Yep, we were together. Yep, and once when I was fishing, I was trout fishing, and the guy was just going through the creeks like on opener or something. But I never see them. At, the thing that I feel is, as long as you're not an idiot, and you treat them with respect, and you're not breaking any laws, yep. they're going to be nice guys. Generally, I'm sure there's the the odd guy that's yeah. you know having a bad day, but you know, buy your fishing license. It's the law. Don't keep fish out of season. Don't do anything illegal, and they're not going to have a problem with you. Yeah. And the thing is, too, like, if, if I had to throw my two cents in, these are guys where, again, they're, they're spread super thin. They have to take every everything. They do have to take it seriously because their job is a serious one, yeah. 100%. And so they can't allow things to pass because there's, for every person that they find, there's 100 that they're not just because of the numbers that are, they're, they're spread so thin. So if there's something that they see that needs correcting, they'll do it. 100%. So if you're being a, a jerk to them and you're t- talking back and trying to argue your point when just the fact of the matter is that you're wrong, <laughs> you're going to have trouble with them. Yeah. They're going to get pretty firm with you pretty quick, I'm sure. And I would not fault them at all for that because they need to get that stuff done. There needs to be, um, not an example made out of people, but there needs to be uh, like people to, to see the, the reason to follow the law. Yeah. So I, I, I've never had any issues with them. The guys that I had were fantastic. And whenever I met. talk to them, they're like great. at the shows, they're all they're all really nice yeah. guys. And, and you girls. ask them questions too. Like I know oh, you've yeah. asked questions. Like, look, here's an area I can't tell on the regs if this is part of what zone and what I can fish. Like they're happy and, to and help. Like, hey, yo, this is this, this is this, and it might be opposite to what we've heard from other people who, you know, even professional fishermen. The guys are like, no, nope, that's actually okay to do this, or it's okay to do that. Yeah, they're they are there to help spread information more than anything. They want to make sure that people are aware. And are following the guidelines are there for a reason. So, yeah, like I said, never had an issue with them myself. Yeah, and the thing is, too, you have to remember, like, we live in dangerous times now. Like, things yeah. are different than they were. Like, these guys Especially, are going out there to be like, hey, 
can I see your guys' license? Yeah. And they don't know if and this guy has a weapon might, on them. Yeah. So like even hunters are approaching guys that have a loaded. And yeah, yeah, when you do your training for having your firearms license, if you're approached by them, like it's it's hammered into you in training of you have to make sure you unload your do this. You show them that the the, bear, the chamber is empty. You as soon as they say anything to you, you are unloading that fast as humanly possible. Because the second that you are procrastinating, that gets on their nerves because they have to protect themselves. It's you have the a gun that like, <laughs> they're walking towards you, and now you're worried you're not going to have a good day. Like, <laughs> and with fishing, like it's hunting is definitely serious, but with fishing too, they don't know what kind of weirdo they're going up to. 100%. Not everyone's as cool I've seen as weirdos we at the creeks all the time. Oh, I was fishing <laughs> with one last week. Just kidding. <laughs> so that that's a good question. And if you're, you know, if you know a conservation officer, or if you're one listening, you know, awesome. Thanks for all your hard work. Yeah. Uh, what's your guy's favorite lake? Not necessarily for fishing. So my favorite lake is... And that lake is fantastic. You know, I would go to every day if I could. And there's so many different fish in lake. We go all the time to... Yeah. Right? I'm going to say a different one. Can you can you bleep over this for me too? Maybe. Right. You better. Because okay. it's not just, not just mine. I, I got this... Uh, I actually... Uh, met Bob McGarry. He's from Ontario Out of Doors, and we were a great guy. He showed me his I was in his house doing some work, and he was showing me some of his mounts and record fish and stuff like that. Really cool guy. And uh, so we got to talking, and, and he told me of a, a lake that he was interested in that he uh, had heard some good things about. Lake. I love it. I was there. That's where I caught my biggest smallmouth bass. It's a good within lake. season. I've been there, yeah. And it's. There's there's musky, there's pike, there's walleye. And it's there's an under, smallies, underrated lake. Underrated, underrated and lake. and yeah, it's uh, perfectly accessible for the boats that we use. Yeah, it's perfect. But so you, know, you can't you have to you can't leave that name in there because then Bob McGarry is going to come hard down on this podcast yeah. and oh, I don't want to get banned by Ontario Doors. I, I want to be on their good doors. side. I like that magazine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. All right, and with then, a terrible answer. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. Last one. What is the fish you enjoy the absolute most and why? To catch, I assume. Doesn't say. So okay. it could be like, you know, overall, you might really like catching carp, but do you like eating them? And you're like, you know what? I'll change my answer to walleye, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I I don't know. That's a very, like, it's again, a, it's, it's a, we're in Ontario. There's so many fish. Yeah. But I have to say, and this is not going to surprise so, anyone. So here, I'll, I'll, I'll change that question. So that one. I had an answer, though. Okay, well, you can give it, but so that's from the the Rod Father nine one nine. Um, I keep forgetting to to say the names, but so, anyways, the what else the question is? So, in we've answered the question before of if we could only catch one fish or the rest, what would you go? Yeah. So, I think mine was smallmouth bass. Mine was pike, and yours is pike. So, let's let's give either uh, a more in-depth answer if it's the same fish or a different fish okay so i think the way that i like this question is like what's the fish that i most enjoy catching that's good the enjoyment of it so like i and i'm not a hard car a hardcore carp guy but i have to say some of my most enjoyable days fishing uh and with you andrew has been those days when you know we get off work you know when we work we're not not working full-time boys over yeah. here you know we we work with our hands and at the end of the day we just want to sit down and you know crack open a a cold beverage or, or drink a coffee and we bring our lawn chairs or like our folding camping chairs yeah. and we go down to the local carp spot you know we we throw in some some chum we set up our bait feeders on the you know we have the rod pod with the bait alarm so we don't yeah. have to really watch the rod yeah and then we just sit back and relax and talk and sometimes we catch nothing sometimes we catch 20. Yeah. And it's just like you're talking, it's relaxing, it's you know, game. it's getting dark. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, I love it. That, that's that's true. That's actually a really good answer. And I don't know you can't what top mine that. is anymore. You no, can't top that. No, that's... Well, why don't you just expand on that? Because like, I know we both really enjoy it. And I know you're always like, oh, we're old men now because we like this. But like when we were young, not as much. For me, it's like, so it's like bobber fishing for me has always been like amazing. Like it, it it's nostalgic, but I, I still love to this day bobber fishing. It's cool. And carp fishing, you're not watching a bobber, but you're still like you're sitting there, you cast out it's it's a game of patience. Mm-hmm. You're sitting on in, in a nice comfy chair. Like we got some nice chairs now. Like yeah. we're we're sitting there and we got a wagon, comfy. we bring everything, yeah. yeah. And you know, you can bring a snack, whatever. And and you're sitting there and it's yeah, long day after work. 
and you just spend it into the nice cool hours of the evening and just sitting on a bank with with your buddy and hearing some coyotes howling in the yep. background you yep. know maybe some splashing of the fish and you know when we catch nothing it's like we don't feel that like oh that was a waste of time we're like oh you know what that we just had a, eating that was, yeah we that just was had nice. a great we conversation back to the car and we go home we talk fishing and when we have like if we catch one we always say if we catch one fish today that's, that's great that's a great day if we catch one each, that's amazing. Yeah. Any more than that, like we're Bonus. it's it's incredible. Like, and the way that we carp fish, and I don't know if anyone else does this. So like, you know, we have a rod pod. We usually like you have two rods, I have three rods because you're allowed to use three rods for carp. But yep. usually when we go to that particular spot, we we'll have two. we'll have three rods going usually. Yeah. So I have There's a rod no pod with three you know spots for rods, and we'll we'll cast out three rods, and then the first rod that goes off, whoever's rod that is, that's their fish. And then after that, we just switch. So that yep. even if it's my rod, the next fish that goes off, it's Andrew. And then yep. we switch back. So that way it's fair and there's action. It's not like, you know, I'm catching all the fish if I happen to have the hot rod of the night. Because yep. sometimes it just happens to be like one, yep. you know, spot. And then that way, you know, it's fair. We're catching fish and it's exciting the whole night. And we'll go with like a couple of friends or sometimes. And, and that way too, like when you go with friends or I know we went with my wife, we went with a with my buddy royce there and it's like first fish it's shout out to royce yeah so you know the first fish is is our guest because just now you know we might have been oh. carp fishing for you know a few weeks already caught some yeah and so it's yeah first fish or if let's say jesse is gone or i've gone before the other person and we go out generally we'll give the first fish to the guy who hasn't caught one yet that year yeah and it's it's cool just to have that it's not like a community where it's like a bunch of people but it's just your little group and, and, it, it and just shows it's getting everyone. It's not about the, the fish. No, it's about fishing with yeah. your friends and, and this, and you know, making the sport more enjoyable for everyone. Yeah. And carp fishing is, is super easy to get into. Yeah. Well, we're going to do an episode on that. Actually, 100%. this is a sneak peek, but we have an episode coming up in May Yeah. and we actually have a podcast guest. Yeah. He's not our first guest, but he's one of the first guests and he is a carp guru and he's going to, I'm going to try to dumb it down for, for like normal people like us yeah. because like he's into like all the fancy stuff, yeah. but he's also good at keeping it simple too. So we're excited to have yeah, him we'll on. explain stuff in layman's terms and whatnot yeah. too. So we're not going to use like triangulation and stuff. It'll just be like <laughs> hooks. <laughs> but anyway, we're excited about that. This has been a good podcast. Yeah. I really like, you know, trout fishing and steelhead fishing, and I know it is hard for some people to get into it. Yeah. And we'll probably do an episode uh, possibly, I mean, you tell me, Jesse, because you have the schedule. I scheduled from, it but, out until June already. But, um, you know, at some point, we'll, I know at some point we'll talk more about doing stream trout. Like instead yeah, of the, the sure. steelhead run, stream trout is, is one of my favorite pastimes. It is. In, uh, you know, when the warm weather hits and there's some drop back still, but but I'm I'm there for the You're native focusing trout. on the native yeah. trout. I love it. And, so. and generally with this podcast, as you notice, we kind of try to keep it seasonal. So like right now it's April. We're talking about, you know, openers coming up. We yep. want to talk about steel. And then guess what? Next month we're going to be talking about carp and walleye and, and pike. And then throughout the summer, it's going to be more bass. So we're going to keep it fresh every month. Mm-hmm. And again, if you have any suggestions on topics, send us a DM. Yep. And again, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Fish Heads Canada, for yes. giving an amazing prize. And Nature Daddy's won. Yep. You know, and it Way just goes go. to show you. If you enter these giveaways, you have a pretty good chance of winning. Right now, we're getting quite a few entries. Like a lot of the entries, we're getting like 30, 40, 50 entries. Yeah. But As still, our podcast is growing and it one is. One to 50 odds is great yeah, odds. That's not bad. <laughs> for so, for ha- not having to pay anything to get into it. 100%. Like, and, and we're going to have some pretty sweet giveaways yeah. coming up. Like this giveaway today was amazing. Yep. We'd like to thank Fish Heads again for that. But if you didn't win the giveaway and you'd like to support a local company, and try some of that row I was talking about. Definitely check out Fishheads, fishheads.ca or fishheads.com. And yeah. uh, he has like everything you'd need. So that's the last uh, thing that I had to say for this episode. But again, trout openers just around the corner. If you're super stoked about that, like yeah. I'm excited for everyone. A lot of people do like the whole camp out before and everything, <laughs> but uh, definitely tag us in your pictures of steelhead that you catch and we'll try to repost those on our Instagram account. So we'd like to thank you for all listening. Again, we mentioned our last podcast it's been going fantastic so we really appreciate you guys listening like the response and the views that we're getting immediately when we upload we'll get like a lot of views right away and i'm like wow this is crazy (laughs) and i'll send pic like i'll send pictures of andrew the screenshots of our podcast stats and And like like, i I was like look at this man look at this 10 a.m at work i was like on my phone like oh this work sucks i'm like podcast doing well (laughs) yeah so we'd like to thank everyone it only it's only made possible by you guys actually yeah. you know downloading these episodes and listening to them yeah. and the more people that listen so like definitely if you have someone that you know that listens to podcasts and they like fishing 
tell them about our podcast because the yeah. more downloads we get the bigger the giveaways we can get we can use that as leverage for bigger uh, giveaways for companies yeah. so definitely do that and if you haven't yet given us a review we've saw a lot of great reviews already yeah. on spotify now we have some amazing reviews there. thanks for the re- we're actually going to read some of the reviews next week nice. maybe that sounds a bit cheesy but some of them are really good I, just, I feel like i should read some of them but please give us a review and if you're listening to this on youtube thanks for watching us and please leave a comment so we're gonna head out now and tight lines everyone <laughs>